Hello everyone and welcome to the next in our TRSP webinar series. My name is Julia Lappin. I'm a, the clinical director for the Tertiary Referral Service for Psychosis and I'm a clinician and researcher working as associate professor at the University of New South Wales Discipline of Psychiatry and Mental Health. I've had about 20 years of experience working clinically and in research aimed at improving outcomes for people living with psychotic illness. So I'd like to start by an acknowledgement of country and of lived experience. I acknowledge the strength and resilience of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are the traditional custodians of the diverse countries from which we are joining this meeting. I'm privileged to be calling from the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining the webinar today. I also acknowledge people with lived experience of mental illness, mental ill health and recovery, and the experience of people who have been carers, families or supporters. So welcome to the Mind Gardens Tertiary Referral Service for Psychosis seminar series. The TRSP is a New South Wales Health funded statewide service hosted by South East Sydney Local Health District. And we're grateful to South East Sydney Local Health District and New South Wales Health and the Mind Gardens Geoscience Network for their ongoing support of the TRSP service. Our service aims to improve the lives of people living with complex psychosis. And we do so through the delivery of our clinical service, which welcomes referrals from across the state of anyone living with psychosis and who's cared for in New South Wales public mental health services. We also run education and training programs which are aimed at enabling clinicians to build capacity in evidence-based treatments of people with complex psychosis. And this webinar series is an example of that capacity building. We're supported by Mind Gardens Neuroscience Network, which is a collaboration partnership between Neura, Black Dog Institute, UNSW Sydney, and the Southeastern Sydney LHD. Our Mind Gardens TRSP webinar series will run through 2023 monthly, and many of you have joined us for our previous uh, sessions. Please look out, as always, for emails about upcoming TRSP events, which will detail future webinars. So before I introduce our speaker, just a little bit of housekeeping. You can write questions in the chat, but you won't be able to speak or be seen. There will be a simple anonymous poll towards the end of the webinar. Please complete it so that we know how helpful this event was to you. We also appreciate your feedback by email. We record the event and will distribute a link to the event video within two weeks to everyone who provides us with an email address. You can opt out of our communications at any time with a return email with unsubscribe in the subject line. Now, finally, it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor Grant Sara. So Grant is a friend and colleague and a collaborator. He's a psychiatrist working in public mental health and in epidemiology as director of INFORM at the Ministry of Health. Grant is an adjunct professor at Units W Discipline of Psychiatry and Mental Health and a clinical professor at the University of Sydney. He's co-chair of the National Mental Health Data Governance Forum. So I'll pass over to you, Grant, for your talk. Thanks very much. Great. Look, thank you. Uh, thank you, Julia, and thank you, everybody, for the opportunity to talk about this work that we've been um, doing, looking at um, this overlap between physical health and mental health issues uh, in people who use our mental health services in New South Wales. Um, so uh, I'll just... Uh, let me know if the screen hasn't come through. It looks like I'm sharing my screen now at this end. Um, so, um, but the, um, uh, just wanted to start also by acknowledging, so I'm speaking to you from Cameragle land, uh, acknowledging their elders past, present and emerging, and also um, paying respect to any Aboriginal colleagues who are on the line today. And also when we're talking about uh, 
data, um, just to acknowledge that we're using data from many thousands of people who've used New South Wales uh, health services and mental health services, and we do that with, um, with respect and gratitude. So what I wanted to do in this presentation was briefly fill you in on this uh, Mental Health Living Longer Data Linkage project, talk about some of the limitations that are particularly relevant to this um, focus on psychosis, um, and then walk you through some findings in a few of those areas listed there, uh, and then talk about potential implications of that for areas where we might, as a health system, think about acting. Um, this slide is really about the scale of the problem. Um, this is a, showing you the life expectancy of uh, people in New South Wales uh, broken down by local health district. The blue dots are the LHD populations. The orange dots are mental health consumers, uh, consumers of our public mental health services in those LHDs. Um, and you can see, looking at the blue dots, um, life expectancy is higher in, uh, in, in metropolitan Sydney, particularly in, in eastern Sydney and more affluent areas. Um, but in fact, when you look at the orange dots, um, wherever we are in the state, there's a gap. And in fact, the, the mortality gap is greatest in, in our more affluent areas. Um, so I imagine everyone involved in the care of psychosis understands that that's a problem. I don't think that would be as, as, you know, as shocking as the gaps are. I don't, sadly, it's not news to most of us in the sector. Um, but one issue about life expectancy as a measure is it's a challenging um, measure to change. You know, we, we know that life expectancy is a really complex measure. Life expectancy is determined by many factors, socioeconomic factors, broad health system factors. Um, and there's no simple lever that the health system overall, or particularly a mental health service, can kind of pull that rapidly changes life expectancy. Um, and so the, the work we've been doing in the data in this Mental Health Living Longer Data Linkage Project is trying to develop data that helps us get below that life expectancy headline um, to find areas we can act. Um, before I describe it, I'll just point out down in the bottom right of this slide, there's a QR code. Um, and there's a few more of those as the slide as the presentation goes on. So those, if you've got a camera and you want to point it at that, um, that'll take you to a link to the open access full text um, publication relevant to the section where we're talking about. Um, so but the, the Living Longer project, it, it's a data linkage that, that, uh, that we've initiated in the ministry, um, trying to bring together a wide range of data collections that New South Wales Health has, data from our health services, community mental health, hospital, um, but also general health private and public hospital data, emergency department data, and a whole lot of data relevant to physical health, um, cancer screening, cancer notifications, renal dialysis, and so on. There's some, most of those we already have, some particularly in vaccination and notifiable conditions we're hoping to get in the next um, few weeks coming through in the next linkage. Um, it's an ongoing linkage. Most of the data goes back to the, at least the mid 2000s. Um, and it in, currently includes data on nearly 10 million people. and. That's because we're not only getting data on people who use mental health services, we're also getting data on the whole population. So we can compare and understand where the gaps are biggest. We aim for this to be good research, but our primary aim is for this to help support um, policy and planning and practice and system change and translation within, within New South Wales. Um, so before, typically when you, when you read a paper, the limitation section is at the end. Um, but I just wanted to start with one really important limitation you know, in this context, um, which is to do with diagnosis. Um, so what that, the, the overlapping circles there are showing you how our data set is made up. So we're looking at people who've had care with hospital mental health services or community mental health services, only our public services, not, not Medicare or private services. Um, and within that, um, to, for, when we look at um, our cohort, typically about two thirds of people, their only contact has been with community mental health services. Um, if, when we look at people who've been in hospital, hospital admissions very rarely have missing diagnoses. Diagnoses are allocated by, by clinical coders. Um, but um, in our community data, it's us as clinicians that enters the, and enter the diagnostic data. Um, and more than half of individuals in that community only set uh, of people um, have no diagnosis recorded. Either the diagnosis is blank or more often there's a diagnosis of F99, which is mental health, not otherwise specified. Um, so so um, it, it means that it's very hard for us to give you detailed data. And I can't, as much as I would like to today, to really describe in detail findings just for people with psychosis. 
having mostly what I'll be talking to you about is is data on all people who've had contact with mental health services. Having said that, we know that um, that means this will be a kind of lower limit estimate of of the scale of the problems that because uh, in in most of this data, um, people who are living with psychosis have even worse outcomes um, when you when you can um, tease those out. It's worth pointing out too that um, it's not just um, uh, people who have brief contact. Uh, so we, um, in our community mental health services, we see a lot of people for very short periods in emergency departments or for brief assessments. And a very high proportion of those, that top bar there, 76% MUNS recorders have no diagnosis recorded. That's perhaps not surprising. But if you looked at the bottom, we also see a lot of people. And in fact, they make up the bulk of the work that our, our um, public sector services do um, for, for longer periods, six to six months to two years, or even longer than two years. And even in that group, for people longer than two years, about a quarter of people um, don't have a valid diagnosis recorded in any one of their contacts. So um, if one take home message, if I, you know, would be to any, um, to, 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 to us as clinicians would be, please, anything you can do to, to make sure you do enter a valid ICD-10 diagnosis in your EMR um, will make a big difference to the ability to use data for research and for planning and policy. The main way we've tried to work around that in, um, in this research is to use an operational definition of severe or persistent mental illness, where we, we look at people who've got a diagnosis of psychosis or more than two years of mental health service contact. Um, and uh, so that is an approach we're taking to try to subgroup the data. But mostly what I'm talking to, to, to you about today is just focusing on all mental health service users. Now, having said there's those um, important limitations, um, and, and there are many limitations in big administrative data sets, but I, I think just wanted to make the point that there is still value in imprecise data. So here on the right, we've got an MRI, very precise, very crisp and clean, low noise, um, and kind of diagnostic and definitive in its own way. Um, on the left, we've got a bone scan, which is kind of zoomed out and a bit fuzzy. Um, and it's not necessarily diagnostic, um, but it definitely says there's something going on over here that might need a closer investigation. And in a lot of ways, this epidemiological research and health service data, we could think of as much more like a bone scan than an MRI. It's really saying at a very zoomed out level, here's something that might need local investigation. Um, and, and that's very much one of the goals of the, of the data. And, and, you know, I think there's still value in that. But for that, to have that value, uh, the data's got to have a couple of properties, really. Um, so ideally, what we want to do is develop data that is on issues where it's possible to act. You know, life expectancy, for example, is a hard thing to act directly on. So it's things that we can act more directly on. Um, it, ideally, the data should be as recent as possible, and it should be as local as possible and as detailed as possible in terms of understanding the who um, uh, and, 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 and where of where services, uh, uh, where efforts could be made. Um, to, to, to improve things. And in that sense, what we've really tried to focus on is data in that spectrum of things from prevention through to care and support, where we do, as health services, have some in influence. Um, and I won't talk about all of these areas today, but, but these are some of the areas where we're trying to develop the data um, from, from prevention through to, um, through to uh, specialist care. Um, so what I wanted to do was just start in the middle, though, here with um, preventable medical admissions. Um, so um, avoidable hospital admissions are uh, a major issue. There's the, you know, each year in New South Wales, many, many thousands or tens of thousands of avoidable hospital admissions. And, and I guess what we mean by that is admissions for conditions, for diagnoses where um, uh, high rates of admission suggest upstream failures. So we've got a set of national definitions in, in Australia um, uh, of potentially preventable hospitalizations, PPH, um, and uh, they're, they're, they're grouped into chronic conditions, acute conditions, and vaccine preventable conditions. And, and where there's high rates in, in a region or a group, it suggests that integrated care, primary or preventative care, um, perhaps uh, is, is uh, deficient. So we've had a look at that in, in a large group of mental health service users across the state over a few years. Um, and, and what you're seeing here in these blue bars is what we would expect to see if, if, if sort of the horizontal axis here is bed days. Um, and um, what you would expect to see if, if our mental health service users had the same um, number of admissions and the same length of stay as the rest of the New South Wales population for these conditions. 
what we actually see is this really big gap. Um, so the orange shows, you know, the, the, the sum of the two uh, shows the so it shows the, the the total bid days that we did see. The orange is the gap um, in our mental health service users. And so you can see three big groups stood out to us. First was a set of chronic conditions um, uh, you know, around uh, chronic uh, lung and heart and metabolic conditions. Um, second, a whole lot of acute infections. Um, and third, and probably strikingly, um, uh, a, a lot of vaccine preventable conditions. I mean, this was data from before COVID, um, but uh, influenza, uh, pneumonia, um, uh, and hepatitis, uh, making up a lot of that there. So in fact, what, what we see is that there's a kind of compounding effect here that, that mental health service users have a nearly three times increased risk of having at least one admission for one of these preventable medical conditions. Um, they then stay, uh, have, have more likely to have multiple admissions per person and stay much longer in hospital. So all up about a five-fold um, uh, difference in bed days in hospital. And that has huge personal impacts and huge system impacts. Um, the, uh, that AIR uh, there, the adjusted incident rate ratio, is really just to make the point that all of these figures that I'll be showing you are mainly adjusted for age, sex, and uh, socioeconomic disadvantage. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's not just that these issues that we see are just driven only by disadvantage or differences in age and sex, um, that, that even when you adjust for that, those, um, that the differences are really striking. Um, really very relevant to people with psychosis is not only are risks increased, um, not only in the sense of the curves shifted up, they're also shifted left. The risks occur much younger. So here you've got um, the rate of onset of those preventable hospital conditions um, by uh, broken down by age group in, in the, the New South Wales population in blue, mental health service users in orange. Um, and you can see that, of course, those admissions get more common as people get older in the general population. But, but those age-related increases occur much earlier, particularly for chronic conditions and for vaccine-preventable conditions. Um, you can see those kind of steep increases in people in their 40s and 50s. Um, and if, if we look at the relative risks, you know, that which is really the, the orange divided by the blue line, uh, you can see that right across sort of the middle ages, uh, you know, 35 through to 65, the relative risks are quite high. So depending on the, on the condition you look at, um, for, for mental health service users age 35 to 65, risks are five to tenfold um, uh, the, the, the rate for the rest of the population. Now, um, that's really you know, an age where many people who are living with enduring psychosis uh, are in that age group. Um, and, uh, and, and so that represents really a minimal estimate of the extra risk there. That having said that, that there's impact on individuals and there's impact on the system. Um, and just to put that in perspective, because relative risks can feel a bit um, uh, hard to interpret in terms of absolute rates. So the, the group of people we looked at in this particular data we represented about 2% of the total New South Wales population, but they made up nearly 10% of all preventable hospitalisation bed days in New South Wales. And in, in any New South Wales hospital, effectively, you know, one in eight people in hospital for diabetes complications, um, nearly one in six for vaccine preventable conditions, and nearly a third for nutritional deficiency are people who've had contact with mental health service users. So extremely disproportionate in terms of impact on the individuals and on, on the health system. Um, I wanted to move now and focus in and zoom in a little bit on vaccine preventable um, conditions. This is some work we've been doing with um, Patrick Gould from uh, from Mind Gardens in South East Sydney. Um, and um, looking at uh, that really high rate and trying to understand it a bit more. So we looked across five years of data to, to get larger numbers and, and zoomed in and looked at a wider range of vaccine preventable conditions. Um, and, and what you're seeing here is the rate per 100,000 for mental health service users in orange versus other conditions, uh, other, other New South Wales residents, sorry, in blue. Um, and we overall looked at vaccine preventable conditions and then broke them down for respiratory illnesses, hepatitis, and, uh, and other conditions. But about 95% of those admissions were uh, COVID and influenza, uh, vaccine preventable pneumonias like pneumococcus or hepatitis B. Um, and there's a lot of other conditions with very, very low rates of admission. 
And what you find, what we found was that um, after adjusting for, for um, the differences um, in age and sex and disadvantage, mental health service users were, were more than three times more likely to have vaccine preventable admissions. Um, and that's true across the board. And when we looked at the individual conditions, it was also true um, right across the board. Um, the, if we look across the state, um, this is the LHD rates. Again, the blue is the LHD population, the orange is mental health service users. So we can see that in the, if we look at the gradient of the blue dots first, you can see that the highest rates of vaccine preventable hospitalisation in New South Wales occur in the city, particularly in, in southwest and western Sydney, um, uh, and lower rates in rural and regional areas. But wherever you are in the state, there is a very large gap and proportionally similar gap. So the gaps range from about two and a half times up to nearly fourfold. Um, and again, these gaps are likely to be higher in people living with psychosis. This slide's also looking at that issue we discussed earlier about not only greater risk, but earlier age of onset. So here you've got you can see that vaccine preventable hospitalizations increase in mental health service, service use, uh, in the general population in, in blue uh, as people get older. Um, but in fact, in, in our mental health service users, they increase much more steeply, much, much younger. And so you can see those relative risks, these gray bars here, um, again, five to six times more likely, particularly in men in that age group, but also much more uh, you know, much higher relative risks in, um, in women in their 40s and 50s um, who are using our services. So now just to move, um, in a sense, upstream in terms of uh, prevention or, um, and think about um, um, cancer screening. And cancer screening is obviously a really critical area where there's really good evidence for the effectiveness. So participation in breast and cervical cancer screening halves the mortality rate for cancer in people who um, participate. And um, so we've been looking at both breast and cancer screening in our mental health service users in New South Wales. And the headline finding for cervical cancer screening is there. You can see that in the broader population of, of New South Wales, uh, it's just over half of women in the eligible age range are, uh, are screened um, each year. Mental health service users is only about 40%. That's um, an incident rate ratio um, of 0.74. And to put that in perspective, that means over two years, that would have been 16,000 more mental health service users would have been screened um, if, uh, if rates matched that of other New South Wales women. Um, and as we've seen with the other conditions, it's not just an overall increase in risk for all, equally for all ages. It's, it, there's big differences and widening gaps as people get older. So here we can see this, the screening rates for the population and mental health service users broken down by age group. And you can see that in women under 34, um, rates uh, for mental health service users in orange are, are quite close to those of, the, of, of um, uh, the, the rest of the population. But as, um, uh, as people get older, um, the, the, those really diverge. And particularly for women in their 60s and uh, and, and, and uh and, and later, um, the screening rates really are very, very low. So, so definitely women in their kind of 30s to 50s and, and beyond, um, there's much lower rates of screening. And again, the same pattern, quite a lot of variation. In fact, it, you know, relatively more variation in this between LHDs um, than in some some other issues. So if you look at the, the gradient of the blue dots being the, the population rates, you can see that the highest screening rates tend to be in Eastern Sydney and in um, rural and regional areas along the coast. Um, and uh, But you can see again quite big variations uh, across the state. Um, uh, but also some LHDs where the gaps are quite small. Um, and so there's potentially, you know, uh, things to be learnt, uh, issues that could be zoomed in on to try to understand what's happening in those LHDs that's resulting in slightly better um, uh, screening rates in, in mental health service users. Um, yeah. So this is similar data looking at breast screen participation, another really important um, area. Breast cancer is still one of the leading causes of mortality in Australian women. and um, and what we find is that 
Um, the overall population screening rate is just over 53%. In our mental health service users, it's um, uh, around 30%, so 43% less likely um, to have had a screening mammogram than other women of the same age. And uh, again, here's how it varies across the, the state. It, for breast screening, the, the pattern is different to cervical screening because the, the mechanisms of delivery are, are different. So breast screens delivered through that you know, very visible program with vans and centers. Um, and the highest population screening rates tend to be in the rural and regional local health districts. Um, um, but wherever we are, again, in the state, you can see there's quite large gaps in mental health service users. Um, and uh, so um, that, that variation is continues to be there. The um, one of the reasons we we're keen to look at the breast screening, and, and we're we're trying to continue to develop the data to look upstream of that and look at what are the impacts of that, is clearly you know the point of screening is to detect cancer early and, and allow better intervention. And so we had a look at. Um, uh, a stage of cancer a diagnosis in, in women who use mental health services. Um, and what we found that uh, mental health service users are less likely to participate in breast screening, as you've just seen, but also they were 60% more likely to have advanced um, cancer disease when first diagnosed. Um, so, but, but the story was complicated. Um, and so what you're seeing here is three groups um, broken down by whether women had had no screening past screening, so screening more than two years ago, or recent screening, screening within the last two years. So in every group, you can see that um, mental health service users in orange have higher rates of um, metastatic disease, which is the darker bars at the bottom, or regional spread, um, which is the paler colors at the top half. Um, and um, so adjusting for screening only slightly reduced the relative risk. So um, this, this doesn't mean that screening is not good and is not preventing illness. You can see there's that gradient across from left to right of that, that slide. Um, but it does mean that there are other things going on that we need to understand that are also increasing risk of advanced disease in women who use mental health services. Um, there's important data we don't have in this data set. Um, we don't have data on people's reproductive history or smoking status, and those have both been linked to different rates of progression of breast cancer. Um, and also there's some speculation um, about the role of dopamine um, active antipsychotics in increasing um, breast cancer risk as well. As a, as, so there's more work needed on these kind of questions. Um, now to move from one end, you know, from the preventative end through to the sort of higher cost treatment end. Um, and just, just we've just been in the last, um, uh, six or 12 months, particularly looking at some work on surgery um, and uh, trying, because surgery is has been understudied as, a, as an issue in, in looking at, at the physical health gaps. It's a big part of our health system. It's a big part of our health, how our health system is judged and a big, a big part of the cost of healthcare in Australia. Um, but there's not a lot of evidence. So we've looked at this at a couple of different levels. The first is looking at a set of sentinel procedures. So it's just a handful of individual procedures. Um, and if we think about what do we expect to see in people who use our mental health services and in, in people living with psychosis? Well, on the one hand, we might expect to see more need, a higher rate of chronic conditions, um, less access to preventative care. We've seen that in the preventable hospitalizations data. Um, but also, we, you know, we sadly might expect to see a whole lot of barriers to access. Um, some of them will be financial, some of them will be you know, more health system behavior, you know, diagnostic overshadowing, different, you know, the gatekeeping and referral processes that guide access to surgery. Um, so um, we started by having a look at this, these um, so-called sentinel procedures. So these are procedures that AIHW, the, the national data um, body, uses as sort of rough measures of, of surgery access. And, and what we found was that um, mental health service users had uh, about a 20% greater rate of uh, overall surgery. Of, uh, um, but it was broken down very differently based on whether the surgery was planned or emergency. So um, it was a 19% increase in planned surgery. Um, and planned surgeries make up about 
uh, three quarters of surgery in New South Wales of, of, of the types of surgery we're looking at. Um, but a, more than threefold, so three and a half times increased in the risk of emergency surgery. Um, and clearly, uh, an emergency surgery um, is a is a bad thing. You know, it, it, high rates of emergency surgery mean that people are living for longer with conditions that perhaps they could have had treatment earlier for. So more pain and suffering, more disability, but also emergency surgery um, is associated with worse outcomes, um, higher rates of complication, higher post-surgery mortality, longer stays in hospital. Um, and so ideally, as much surgery as possible should be planned rather than emergency. When, when we broke that down, looking at the individual types of procedures, um, a few different groups kind of emerged. So the 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 um, the top groups there highlighted in pink, and in, in, in this slide, the pink is signifying significant increase, and the and the the um, uh, the blue is signifying a significant decrease. So with these incident rate ratios, um, if they're more than one, that's an increase. If they're less than one, that's a decrease. And if those confidence intervals cross one, um, then it's not a significant difference. So. So what you can see is if you look at that top group, we've got coronary artery grafts, coronary angioplasty, surgeries that are often urgent um, and often for acute and life-threatening conditions. Um, and uh, we can see that um, mental health service users had um, higher rates of both planned and particularly emergency surgery. And you can see a, you know, more than four and a half times risk of emergency coronary artery graft surgery. Um, and that might reflect that in our health system in Australia, we've got you know, sort of a, a universal health system of, of sorts. And, and that in the sense for acute and life-threatening conditions, um, many of which are, many of these procedures happen in public hospitals, that people who are uninsured um, can, can get access to care. Um, but the high rates of emergency surgery relative to plan might suggest that even though rates of access are high, they're not high enough relative to the underlying need. Um, if you look in the middle, there's some conditions there that where the rates were not significantly different from the rest of the population. And then if you look down at the bottom, there's three conditions that I think are interesting where you've got cataracts, hernia repair, knee replacement, where rates are below, or either trending below or significantly below the population for planned surgery. But um, for at least hernia repair, um, the rate of emergency surgery was higher. So the, the reasons there's dashes in the emergency surgery column on the right there is because there's just there were too few emergency surgeries for those conditions um, to, um, to, to to calculate rates reliably. And you know, so, for example, it's very rare to have emergency cataract surgery, for example. But if, in a sense, for that bottom group, you know, one way of looking at that is for conditions that aren't acute and life threatening, but are chronic and disabling that cause pain and disability. Um, Mental health and, and are often done in uh, where the procedures are often done in private hospitals and, and under you know, private health insurance. That people li living with mental health conditions have significantly reduced rates of access, and and for some conditions that's therefore reflected in um, higher rates of people coming in with emergencies due to those conditions not being treated early. Um, so I think that data suggests that kind of combination of both greater need but reduced access. Um, we also wanted to look in detail at that issue of coronary artery surgery, which was you know, um, one where the, the rate of emergency procedures was the highest. Um, and so this is some work that um, a Sydney Uni MD student, uh, Hanif Patel, is just, just um, finalizing with us at the moment. Um, and uh, so this is looking at people who've had a coronary artery bypass graft in New South Wales and comparing mental health service users to others. And, and what we found was that mental health service users come into that surgery with more risk factors. So they're more likely to have more comorbid conditions. 46% um, uh, had um, at least two comorbid conditions. Um, and they're more likely to have an emergency. So 52% of those procedures, more than half procedures, were an emergency in mental health service users compared to about a third in, in other New South Wales residents. But even after you adjust for those things, for comorbidity, for emergency procedures, and also for age, sex, disadvantage, and rural location, mental health service users were still 1.4 times as likely to have complications in hospital, um, things like uh, uh, infections, um, uh, um, uh, um, pulmonary emboli, and so on. Um, and also, um, uh, 1.6 times 
times more likely to die within 12 months um, compared to other New South Wales residents. So um, despite, and, and so those risk factors explain some of that extra risk, but what you're looking at there is the risks after you adjust for those, those extra risk factors. So um, later presentation, much worse outcome. And uh, I haven't included the slide here in the interest of time, but we've um, also done some work looking, this is one procedure and coronary artery grafting, is, is, there's a, about 20,000 a year in New South Wales, but we've um, zoomed right out and looked at about 1.2 million procedures a year in New South Wales. Um, and really we see a very, very similar pattern across pretty much every procedure group um, where there's enough data to look at emergency versus planned rates that that across the board, gastrointestinal, um, orthopedic, cardiovascular, respiratory procedures um, are much more likely uh, to be in an emergency setting in mental health service users. So there's there's I think there's an untold story here about the, the impact that that has on on um, on, on individuals and, and on the system. Um, so just to um, uh, summarise really, I guess, uh, as I said, what we're trying to do in, in pre presenting this data and developing this data is to come up with data on areas which are within our influence as a health system where we can do something about. Um, it's hard to see how we change life expectancy directly, but it, it is, it's easier to picture what we need to do to improve cancer screening or vaccination um, and so on. And I mean, it's easy to picture. That's not to say it's easy to do, you know, and certainly um, in some ways with this work, developing the data is um, the easier part, actually making the change happen on the ground is, the, is this, you know, the sustained and hard hard work that's needed. Um, one of the things in terms of trying to bring that data together to be local, I mean, I've, I've flashed up a few slides here, of, you know, different LHDs and and it's probably, um, it's it's hard to, sort of bear in mind, okay, you know, what, what should I do then as an LHD? Where do I sit across all those various things? I was all over the place on those different graphs. So one thing we're working on um, is developing a, a kind of summary, a dashboard for LHDs. Um, and this is an example from one LHD, where we try to bring together those range of measures. And as we develop more data, we can add more lines to this to say for your LHD, um, he, again, using that same sort of um, uh, idea that the blue is the population. So you can see where does your LHD population, the blue dots, the solid blue dots, sit against the state average. That's the, the vertical blue line. But then where does your mental health service user group, um, which is the solid blue, solid orange um, dot, sit against other mental health service users in New South Wales? So where, how do we compare and where are our gaps greatest? Where are some of the areas where going back to that bone scan metaphor, you know, we think there might be something going on and it might be worth a closer look. Um, and uh, so those are being uh, developed and certainly part of our work as a team at Inform is not just to um, develop data, but to try and help support LHDs in looking at that data. So um, we are, you know, very happy to come and present this data to your LHD to focus in on what it looks like in your LHD. So if anyone does want us to to visit and and you know talk to 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 your staff or to groups of of staff, um, we're very happy to to do that and and present this kind of summary data for, for your for your particular area. Um, look, I guess the other point I wanted to make here is that um, you, this is primarily you know, we're we're mental health clinicians here primarily, and there are many things that we can do as mental health services. But it's clear that we can't solve this alone. That that um, if we look across that spectrum of care from prevention to to um, to specialist care, we've got our role to play. Um, other clinical services across the spectrum have a role to play, and the other purpose ideally of some of this data is to help us engage some of those other parts of the health system, um, and um, and to help support and work with mental health services um, uh, to be able to, um, to, to to identify areas to change. Um, and certainly as an example of that, um, for example, Cancer Institute New South Wales have been very interested and very supportive of this work. Um, the, the data that I've shown you on local health district differences in cervical cancer screening and um, breast cancer screening uh, have been included by Cancer Institute in their regular reporting to chief executives and, and cancer services. And so part of the goal of this data is to help create that awareness and create a slightly more supportive environment. So if you are wanting to do something to help look at 
improving screening in your mental health population, um, the cancer services or the screening services in your region might, or your primary health network might have uh, already been um, primed to be aware of that. And as I said, um, you know, the, the aim of this data is to, is to suggest areas where more detailed investigation is needed, either in terms of research or in terms of local investigation. Um, but the things that really jump out of us, at us, I think, from this data so far uh, are some of these things here. So we, we definitely see low rates of access to simple screening and prevention. And I say simple in inverted commas because implementing it is still complicated. But particularly the things we can do, and if we think about the cohort of people with chronic psychosis, often in their 30s to 50s, um, we can be thinking about vaccination rates, um, and particularly COVID and influenza, um, uh, where there's very high rates, and, and they make up a lot of that steep age-related increase. Um, and there's, there's real benefit there in reducing the severity of illness and the risk of hospitalization. Um, breast and cervical cancer screening um, in, in women in, their, uh, in, in the appropriate age range. So cervical cancer screening from, from uh, adolescence, but uh, from, from, from the 20s, but breast screen in, in um, women in their 50s and beyond are things that we could you know, and should think about including in our regular um, uh, screening of people and assessment of people and, and, you know, and, and thinking about what are the systems that will help make that more acceptable, more safe, more accessible. Um, for people so that they've got a choice um, then to, to opt in and, and have the same kind of rates as the rest of the population. Um, yeah, as we've said, I think one of the really strong messages that's relevant to people with psychosis is that um, high risk in, in, in people in their 30s, 40s and 50s. Um, and, uh, and it's also clear that some of what's driving that is those high rates of medical comorbidities. Um, and so that you know, which is, it, it would be very much on everyone's mind already, um, but the, the impact of that is really evident in this data. Um, I, I, the, the surgical data, um, and, and that's definitely a bit of a work in progress, but I think that issue of to what extent are the people that we're caring for getting access to care, surgical care, particularly for, uh, well, soon enough for those acute and, you know, conditions like um, ischemic heart disease, but but at all for chronic and disabling conditions like osteoarthritis um, or cataracts, um, and what can we do to help um, support them in, in trying to access and navigate a, a system that's at times unfriendly around that. Um, as I've said, with apologies, this, this talk hasn't primarily focused on people living with psychosis. When we, when we can break our data down by that severe and persist, persistent mental illness group, though, um, we do find that on the whole, um, the, 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 the results are even worse. Um, um, although it's by no means true that all these physical health gaps are confined to people with severe and enduring illness. And in fact, it, it's true across the board for all of our um, people that we see in, in public mental health services. Um, but, um, you know, but these estimates that I've given you for this group of people that the tertiary service is involved with would be a lower limit, which is even more alarming. And in that sense, I just wanted to finish with this slide, which is really just to um, talk about why this matters, because it, it might feel um, you know, clinically that sometimes you're trying to focus on areas where we can improve or implement change is kind of is marginal. And, and I guess just um, some work that Gavin Andrews and, and um, the team at Uni New South Wales did you know, 20 years or so ago now, which I think is still very relevant, which is um, speaks to the importance of efforts to improve care, either the mental health care or physical health care. Um, the, what what um, that group did was looked at that total burden of mental health conditions um, and looked at what proportion we were actually averting. And the estimates at that time were that if we looked at um, uh, uh, psychotic conditions, that we were averting about 13% of the current burden of illness with our current coverage and our current care. And that estimate was that if we just keep seeing the same people we see now and optimize our care, we can improve the effectiveness of our system by about a half. We can add another 7% to that. And if we expand the coverage, we can effectively double the effectiveness of our, of our system. But soberingly, that even if we did all of that, 
in the current state of our knowledge with our current treatment, 60% of the burden of, 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 um, uh, of serious illness like psychosis can't be averted. And that's um, that was the estimates 20 years ago. I don't know that we've had dramatic changes in, in the um, treatments and interventions for psychosis since then. Um, but to me, like in, in, in many ways, that's sobering. It means that we need more clinical research to help move that, that drag that you know, horizontal line up. But it also means that efforts to improve care are not at the margins. They're actually, you know, can have a major impact. Um, so, you know, the work of the tertiary um, referral service and trying to optimise care for individuals, you know, work that we can do, you know, in services to um, you know, improve access to evidence-based treatments and, and screening and vaccination and things like that. They, they're all things that are um, about optimising care and, and maximising coverage. And they, they have more than a marginal effect. So I uh, just wanted to finish up there um, and just acknowledge and thank. Um, this is a, um, a small project. We, we, we're, we're just a small project team. Uh, we don't have any extra dedicated funding for this. It's just work that we've taken on and you know, because we think it's critical as part of our, um, our, our role within the ministry and particularly to acknowledge um, Fred Wu and Wendy Chen and Jen Humphrey uh, and uh, Patrick Gould, who we've been very lucky to have working with us over the last year. Um, we've got a steering committee that involves LHDs and pillars. We've got an Aboriginal sovereign steering committee to help guide the work looking at um, these issues through uh, the lens of Aboriginal people. Um, and, uh, and, then, and we also have an academic advisory group. And I particularly acknowledge um, uh, uh, Jackie Curtis and Matthew Large from New South Wales, and Nick Lozier from University of Sydney. Um, and uh, uh, in, in their work, as well as other um, collaborators, and Fabian Millen from UTS. Um, so, uh, look, I will pause there, and before we go to q and I'm just going to pass back to um, uh, Julia to talk about some upcoming seminars, and having acknowledged Jackie Curtis, I'll put up a, a photo of Jackie's <laughs> smiling face. Perfect segue. Thank you, Grant. Thanks for a wonderful talk. Uh, really comprehensive coverage of, of the many problems faced by people with mental health issues um, in terms of their physical health. It's just wonderful to see the, the scope and the depth of the data that you have available to you in form. So wonderful talk, thank you. And I'm sure we'll get lots of questions coming through. So everybody, can I encourage you now to uh, put any questions that you have for Grant into the chat. I see we've got one in the Q&A and I will take that shortly. But generally in the chat, they're quite easy just to keep track of. So questions for Grant in the chat. Meanwhile, we'll stop screen sharing in a moment or two, but I just want to let you know before we go to Q&A about the next in the webinar series, which is being given by um, Professor Jackie Curtis, who is the Director of Mind Gardens and uh, the Clinical Lead for Youth Mental Health here in RLHD Southeast Sydney. Jackie's talk, we have the time wrong there. I'm sorry, that should say the 11th of October. Uh, so 11th of October for the next webinar. And Grant, if you wouldn't mind just going through to the next slide for me. Thank you very much. So I introduced the tertiary referral service for psychosis at the start of the talk. If anyone has any questions about our service or any people that you'd like to discuss with a view to referral, the email address um, is there. And the final slide, Grant, thank you. And this is just a slide showing all the various ways to keep in touch with TRSP and Mind Gardens Neuroscience Network more generally. Thanks, Grant. So we'll stop sharing now. And um, we can move. We can move into the Q and A. So Heather has a question for you, Grant, which came through sort of close to the end of your talk. Um, Heather's working within Allied Health as part of a multidisciplinary team. I mean, this is a this is a big question to answer, but it's very pertinent. So, how would you recommend we could help to change this story for our consumers? I mean. You then touched a little bit on, you know, what can we as mental health clinicians do? I mean, there are many pieces in the puzzle, but how can we start to help change the story? Yeah, look, I, I think 
It is a really good question and, and a big one, as, as you say. And, and I also wouldn't claim to be an expert on the difficult task of, of implementing the change here. Um, but uh, yeah, I think if we use this data as a starting point, I think um, just trying to understand for your particular region and your particular cohort of people that you're seeing, what are the likely areas um, that are, you know, they're relevant. Um, and in some ways, you know, there's probably half a dozen things that you could do, and it really doesn't matter where we start, you know, in some ways, just starting anywhere um, uh, and, and trying to, you know, identify those opportunities, um, uh, yeah, and, and all those sort of basic principles of how we design changes that make a difference, that are sustainable, you know, doing it based on some data, doing it where there's leadership and doing it in partnership with the people affected, whether that's, you know, co-design with the, with the, with the service users, um, or um, you know, co-design with the with the with the the relevant part of the health system. You know, the the, the PHN or the cancer screening service. Um, I mean, certainly looking around for models. If we, you know, and and I think you know, trying to have you know, we do need systems to help share effective models. Um, so, for example, looking at vaccination as a you know an issue that's been you know very close to our hearts in terms of you know that just really jumps out of the data as an area that can make a difference. Um, you know, that's, uh, you know, there are, what, you know, are we prompting um, people? Are we thinking about asking that? You know, have you been vaccinated? How, how, have we got the materials there to be able to have that conversation in a respectful way with people? And then there are service models out there um, that, uh, that, that, you know, Patrick could speak more to, but I think, you know, the evidence there seems to be increasingly doing it in a way that's integrated with the mental health system rather than just, you know, for some people saying, please go to your GP and get, a, get, um, a, uh, um, a vaccination will have an impact, but the more we can say, "Hey, while you're here," or you know, we can um, uh, you know approach people in an integrated way um, with with um, lived experience or peer peer worker support. If, you know, um, you know that those things make a big difference. Um, uh, yeah, breast screening. Uh, it, there's you know resources we can try and direct people to. They're not the world's friendliest resources, and we we are thinking about trying to work with Cancer Institute to develop some sort of consumer facing resources that are a bit friendlier and a bit more suitable. Um, uh, cervical screening, I think there's some discussion about, um, you know, the opportunities, for example, there's been a change to the national screening program to introduce self-assessment. Yes. Um, so in other words, um, you know, so self-administration of, of the screening test, um, which for some people, you know, uh, it might be, you know, less traumatic and more acceptable. Um, and maybe there's things we could do as systems to kind of find a way to do that or provide a safe space and suitable material and support. Um, look, I don't think it would matter. I think finding something that's <laughs> relevant to your local cohort and where there's interest and, you know, I mean, there's, there's, there's no one change is going to address these life expectancy issues. It's going to be hundreds of small changes on hundreds of issues. Um, and that in one way that can feel a bit overwhelming, but another way it's kind of liberating because it doesn't matter where we start as long as we just find something that's doable in, in our context. Yes. And, and there's just so much that could be done at all sorts of levels, aren't there? Like from, as, as you say, like as, as an individual case manager, you can, you know, perhaps remember to ask about, vaccination and screening at a systems level, we can we can start looking at um, smoking, approaches to introducing screening for people that's more acceptable. I mean, there are many, many layers and part part of the picture as well is the the models that we are already trying to develop with primary care about what can be the role of the mental health clinicians what can be the role of primary care and so on so there's there's much to be there's much to be sorted out in this space but interestingly yes. grant as you say you know there is there is a positive reframe here which is that we can get some of the other people if we could get the mental health people up to where the general population is i mean there's room for there's room to move there so that's that's the sort of space that potentially could show change now we've got a few more questions coming in. Lots of thanks for your talk, Grant, and uh, people taking you up on your offer of uh, looking at individual LHDs. Um, one question around that is, who in the LHD would it be offered to? Would it be at the level of the CEO or the clinical directors? 
Um, look, we've we've done some presentations to clinical directors and to chief executives and sort of made that offer. Um, and then uh, uh, the chief executive presentations were just a week or so ago. So, you know, that, that um, uh, still to be arranged. But um, we're happy to talk to staff at every level. Um, and so if um, people want to email me, I think my email was on one of those slides there, but it's grant.sara at health. Um, yeah, we're happy to come to a journal club, to a clinic meeting to you know to organize a site visit um you know whatever works um for your right. for your services all right well hunter new england have got their bid in first there excellent <laughs> okay i'll just read out a comment from um one of our uh people asking a question in acute mental health areas it can be difficult to prioritize physical health care where there's an acute psychiatric issue of course we all acknowledge that and especially when it's preventative health, um, any suggestions on working through those challenges? <laughs> oh, again, look, I wouldn't kind of claim to be, you know, the clinical expert on on that challenge, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think, of course, you know, like timing is important, and um, you know, in in acute inpatient settings, um, then you know, th th we should be realistic about what we can see to achieve. I mean, there are probably things we can do to reduce harms, you know, to think about our medication choices, think about smoking, um, you know, prevention. Um, and, and, you know, even as part of, if we think about discharge planning, thinking about some of those physical health things as, you know, what, what information are we giving? You know, we kind of, we, we may not be able to to make all those changes in the inpatient setting, but we can kind of prime and set up and, yeah, and make it as- an opportunity. Yeah. yeah, and it yeah. at least can be part of the screening, you know, the, to say, okay, well, you know, it's part of the kind of fuller assessment that's possible when when things are less acute. Um, you know, let's let's go through your vaccination history and let's go through your screening history. You know, I, you know, I think about uh, my involvement in in early psychosis. You know, I mean, we would provide all sorts of medication information about contraception and sexual safety, but you know, it, it didn't occur to me at that time to be asking people about no. cervical screening. Um, no. Or even, did you get your cervical vaccination, your HPV vaccination, when you're at school, or were you were you away yes. from school that day? Yes. Um, and so, you know, there's things like that we can do that you may not be able to act on then, but at least can kind of be part of the problem list you think about for future action. That's right, and it's a bit like psychotherapy. You know, once you have awareness of the problems, that's the first step to trying to work out the long process of how to fix them. Yes. Um. So. Jessica McLean at Ministry has asked a question around some of the data that you presented quite early in the piece showing that you've got quite good data on diagnosis in the inpatient setting, but as far as the community setting, it's less good. So is there a way that individuals or others at another sort of level can help improve the quality of those data? Yeah, look, I think it's, uh, and, and you know, I, I, I could get on a soapbox about this and talk for the next 20 minutes, so I'll try not to. But look, um, there's no doubt the EMR, you know, I mean, most of our state uses the Cerner EMR. It really, you've got to almost fight against the EMR to, to enter diagnosis. So it's, I guess I'm just trying to persuade you that it's a fight worth having. Um, it's really about making sure you've got the right, like, A, you've got business processes to look at diagnosis, you know, that it's part of that, you know, 13-week review or... Um, and uh, to check that it's there, and also making sure that it's entered in ICD terminology. So that depending yeah. on exactly your local build, you know, sometimes you've got to do a bit of wrangling to kind of get it to turn off SNOMED and come back to ICD. So you can kind of enter a, an ICD diagnosis. The SNOMED diagnoses, which unfortunately are part of the CERNA world, um, don't flow through into, into diagnostic um, work. There's definitely discussions in the background with eHealth about how to streamline that, but but change with that will be slow and incremental. Yeah. Yes, but just broadly, Graham, we wouldn't expect there to be great difference in the diagnosis of the people in inpatient compared to community mental health services? No, so we, we use, when people have had admissions, we're using their diagnosis from the inpatient setting to allocate yes. the diagnosis, but it's that two thirds of people who've, whose only care has been in the community that we're, where we really yes. need we really need community clinicians to if if you can please fight the good fight <laughs> every time you put f99 somewhere an epidemiologist dies you know so, so please <laughs> please don't uh, please please try yeah thank you all right well look on that on that happy note we'll say many many thanks to you grant wonderful data there are more questions coming through and i might direct those to you at your email address if that's okay yeah please do i'm very happy to try and get back to people
Brilliant. All right. Well, thanks everyone for joining today and thanks especially to Grant. Have a great afternoon. Bye. Thanks, thanks Julia.